My name is Philip Benfey. I'm a professor at Duke University and an investigator with Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Today I'm going to give you an introduction to root genetics. This is part one of a two-part series. In the second part, I'm going to go more in depth into the research that my laboratory performs. And most of it is on root development and root genetics. So I think it's first reasonable to ask, why study plants at all? Why not study something that will be more directly related to human health. And I would present to you the fact that plants are really at the basis of some of the most important challenges facing the planet today. An example, perhaps the best and first example, is climate change. Climate change is having a major effect on agriculture. That is, either when there's too little water in droughts, too much water with floods. But also, I would, I would point out that plants can play a major role in mitigating climate change. Plants are where that the, the leaves take up carbon dioxide to perform photosynthesis. That carbon is then put into roots, a place where they could, you could sequester carbon, take it out of the air, and put it back in the ground where it came from. Plants are also at the, uh, can, are, are part of uh, another way to, to address a major challenge for the planet, <clears throat> which is hunger, human hunger. There are still many cases of malnutrition, and plants are the major source of food for the planet. Third, transportation fuels, energy security. Plants are a potential source for providing liquid fuels, the sort of fuels that are really the only real uh, option, at least in the short term, for things like jet travel. Now, when you're studying plants, you can obviously study the aerial parts of the plant, that is the above ground, the green parts. And I'm going to tell you about studying what it means to study roots. In fact, for most people in general, roots are really thought of as very little. They're, they're out of sight, so people don't think much about them. So it's out of sight, out of mind. And yet, roots play really, really critical functions for plants. The roots are the major location. They're the major place that plants acquire water a critical feature of plant growth. They're also the place where, they, where plants pick up nutrients, that is nitrogen, phosphate, potassium, all those things that plants require to grow. And perhaps something you don't think about too much, but roots are what keep the plants upright. They are what anchor the plant. And so if the roots are shallow or, or not well uh, placed in the earth, with the first wind, a plant will get blown over. And last but not least, roots are where there is the major interaction with microbes. Many of these microbes being bacteria in, in particular, and many of these can be beneficial. The, the, the bacteria are not necessarily pathogens. They can be beneficial, as shown here, where these are, are uh, uh, nodules that form on soybean roots, and those nodules allow the plant to take up nitrogen and, and add nitrogen to the soil. So plants are unlike humans or animals, where the embryo has almost all of the features of the adult. A human embryo, you can see already uh, the head, the arms, the legs, etc. Plants, on the other hand, have, are, are much more potential when they come out of the seed or in the seed. And that potential is at the, the tip of the of the embryo the, at, and the base of the embryo. So when you, the seedling starts to grow, it has a source of stem cells, cells that have the potential to make all the other cells in the body. And there are cells at the tip, which is called the shoot apical meristem. There are cells at the root tip, so the shoot tip and the root tip. And the, the root apical meristem is what makes all of the cells of the root. We decided to work on roots primarily because from a developmental perspective, from asking questions such as how you go from a stem cell to a fully differentiated tissue, roots have some great advantages over even other parts of the plant and certainly over animals. If you look at the root, it actually, if you, if you look at the right side here, they, they are, the, 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 the uh, cells are organized essentially as concentric cylinders. So there's this outer cylinder, a uh, neck cylinder in, et cetera. And if you move that uh, root around, you have radial symmetry. So that's really straightforward. So taking a line from the center of the root outward 
you get all of the different cell types of the root. That, that, root, that uh, line can be drawn in any direction, and you're still getting all of the same cell types. Now, at the very tip of the root, as I mentioned, there are a set of stem cells. What are stem cells? Stem cells are, are cells that have the potential to regenerate and also to give more than one cell type uh, different cell types after they divide. And these, there are four different stem cell populations at the tip of the root, and they give rise to every other cell uh, population in the, uh, in the root itself. So to understand how we go from stem cells to fully differentiated tissue, how, we, how the root or any organ gets organized so that the cells are in the right places, have the right identities, we've taken a genetic approach. Genetics was essentially invented or discovered by Gregor Mendel, who was a monk uh, working in what at that time was Austria. And in his garden, he would look at peas, and he noticed that there were peas that had different colored flowers, different length of their seed pods, etc. To translate that approach to roots, we had to work out an, a, a way to grow roots in such a way that we could see them, we could see their differences. And so for that, we've been working on the plant that is a member of the mustard family. It's called Arabidopsis thaliana. It's a small plant, and we grow it on square petri dishes. These petri dishes are filled with agar that is somewhat similar to jello. And in that agar, there is also the nutrients they need, nitrogen, phosphate, etc. Now, on, on the left, you see a wild type plant that is the normal laboratory plant, and you see the length of the root at this time. And then on the right, you see plants that were, we discovered, we identified as being mutants. And originally, we thought that they were the major and most important feature of these plants was the fact that they had shorter roots. So we named them short root, and that's what you see in the middle here. And it was only later when we took serial sections, we took transverse sections through the root, we noticed that, in fact, these roots had a very striking anomaly. There was something very strikingly different about them as compared to wild type. So if you see on the wild type on the left, you see on the outer uh, level of epidermis, the outer layer of epidermis, inside that, there are eight cells that form the cortex. Inside those eight cells, there's another uh, a layer of cells called the endodermis. Again, eight cells, looking at that transverse section at the top. And inside that, there are smaller cells that constitute the vascular tissue. Now, in short root, when we looked at the section between the outer layer of epidermis and the internal small cells of the vascular tissue, there was only a single layer. So there's a layer of cells that is missing here. We later found another mutant that we called Scarecrow after the, the character in The Wizard of Oz, who was missing a brain. We realized it was missing a cell layer, so we were looking for something that was missing an aspect, a missing a brain for Scarecrow. And here again, we find that there's a single layer between the outer layer of epidermis and the internal layer of the vascular, internal layers of the vascular tissue. Now, how do you make those two layers, the, the endodermis and cortex? Well, that green cell is a stem cell, and it divides first along the transverse axis to regenerate itself. As I mentioned earlier, all stem cells have to have a regenerative process so that they can maintain their stem cell properties. The cell above it then, the daughter of the stem cell, divides along the longitudinal axis to give the first two cells of those two lineages, the endodermis, and the cortex, the blue being the endodermis, the, the yellow being the cortex. And so when we looked at our, our mutants, short root and scarecrow, we said, well, they only have a single layer there, so that second division must have gone wrong. And so at this point, I, let me explain the, the key leap of faith of genetics. In genetics, we have a belief, and it's been shown to be more than a belief, but really to be a fact, that if you can figure out what's gone wrong in the mutant, that tells you what the normal, the, what we call the wild type gene is doing in its normal context. So here we realized that if that second division is missing, then the, both genes, both short root and scarecrow, must be required to get that second division to occur.
And then the question arose, well, what is it that is that remains? If that second division hasn't occurred, does that mean that the, it's produced uh, endodermis? Has it produced cortex? Or is it, has it produced some combination of the two? And so using a number of different uh, antibodies, et cetera, to look at attributes of either cortex or endodermis, we saw that in short root, what had happened was that we had all the attributes of cortex, but none of the attributes of endodermis. Well, in Scarecrow, we actually had attributes of both cortex and endodermis. And so to interpret this, what we said was, well, again, we're using that great leap of faith of genetics, saying, well, if we know what went wrong, what, is it, what, ha what does the wild type gene product, what does the gene in its natural state actually do? And again, there, there are three things that have to happen here. There has to be the division, there has to be specification of endodermis, and specification of cortex. And so in short root, there are two things that, that have gone wrong. The division has not occurred, and endodermis has not been made. So that tells us that the short root gene product has to do two things. It has to make the division and specify endodermis. Well, in Scarecrow, because we see both endodermal and cortex attributes in that cell, it suggested that the primary function of the, short, of the Scarecrow protein in this context is just to make the division. After identifying the probable function of the genes, we wanted to identify the actual genes themselves. And so using a number of different approaches, we actually, what we say, call clone the gene, that is, identified the actual gene that had been mutated. And we use the promoter of that gene. The promoter is the part of the DNA that regulates expression, that, that causes the gene to be expressed in a specific place in the plant. And we ask, is this gene expressed where we thought it would be? That is, is it expressed in that cell that has to divide along the longitudinal axis and perhaps continues to be expressed in one of the two layers? And in fact, what we found was that it's expressed exactly right here. That is the, the cell that has to express, that has to divide to give the endodermis on the inside, the cortex on the outside. It turns out that Scarecrow remains expressed in the endodermis, and that for reasons that we later discovered. We then looked to see about, see if the scarecrow protein was expressed in a similar manner. Now, to do that, we used the same promoter, that same part of the DNA that regulates expression. We now have it driving the coding sequence, that is the region of the DNA that codes for the, the scarecrow protein. And we fuse the scarecrow protein now to GFP itself. So now we're looking at the actual protein expressed in cells. And again, what we see is that it's expressed exactly where we'd expected here. This is the, uh, the, the stem cell that has to divide. It remains on in the endodermis all the way up in that lineage. And so for Scarecrow, it was a very well-behaved gene. It expressed in exactly the cells that we expected. A few more, but that didn't make any difference. And then we, st then we looked at short root. Now, in short root, we had a surprise. When we looked at the short root RNA, so again, on the right-hand side, we see short root promoter driving GFP. So this is where the RNA would be expressed. But just to be sure, we also did something called an in situ hybridization, where we actually use the short root RNA itself and probe the actual, a real section of the root to see where the RNA is. And in both cases, we said, we found that the RNA was not where we expected. The RNA in this case is in those small cells in the middle of the root. This is the vascular tissue. It's not where you'd expect it, which would be in these cells over here. So what's going on here? Well, it, it, it wouldn't be too hard to explain. So an explanation that if this were an animal, the most likely explanation would be that short root perhaps as a transcription factor, that's what we later determined it to be. A transcription factor is a protein that binds to DNA and causes it to be expressed, uh, causes genes to be expressed in some location. So one could imagine that short root goes into the nucleus, turns on another gene, that gene makes a small peptide, for example, that, that moves between the two cells, and 
there's a receptor on the second cell, that then sends a signal down, and that turns on other genes here. In plants, there's another pathway, though. It is possible to, to actually move physically from one cell to the next, to have proteins move between one cell and the next through channels that are called plasma desmata. And the evidence is that that's exactly what's happening with short root, because when we used the short root promoter driving the coding sequence of short root, which was fused to GFP, so when we're now looking at where the protein is, what we see is the protein is actually right where we expect it. It's in the stem cell, and the protein remains in the cells. Each one of these endodermal cells has the protein there. Notice that the protein actually is found in the nucleus. That's that little ball of green inside the red outer uh, edge of the cell. So that is consistent with short root being a transcription factor. Transcription factors, again, bind to DNA. They do that in the nucleus of cells. In fact, short root and scarecrow are members of the same family of transcription factors. Now, so why then do this strange process where the, the protein physically moves from the vascular tissue into the next layer over? Why not just express this factor, this short root protein, in the endodermis itself? <laughs> and so we decided to ask, what if we change the expression, that is, cause short root to be expressed in the endodermis, what would happen? And to do that, in this case, we use the promoter of the scarecrow gene fused to the short root gene. So we've now used, we're going to express short root not where it normally is, in the vascular tissue, but in the endodermis where scarecrow is expressed, <laughs> expressed alongside scarecrow. And what happened then, what we found, was compared to the upper, the upper uh, panel here, which is the normal root, which has the two layers, endodermis in the inside, the cortex in the out. In this case, we see lots of additional layers. So by putting the protein into the endodermis, we cause a massive expansion of the number of layers in the endodermis. And thus, this may be part of the reason why we have this complex process of short root being expressed in the vascular tissue and only moving one layer, layer over. In my second talk, I will go into more depth about how this is done and why short root doesn't move further in the normal situation. But now I want to talk about another aspect of roots. Another reason why we decided to work on roots uh, over 25 years ago. So I've already mentioned that there is this radial symmetry, which simplifies qu asking questions about how cells get specified, how you pattern the root. Well, another simplifying feature of the root is that the stem cells, as I've already mentioned, are at the tip of the root. Now, as you go up any one of these, what we call cell files, that actually corresponds to the age of the actual cell or its developmental stage. So as we've seen, the stem cells divide. The cells that, that they produce then are the first cells of those lineages. And those cells will then go through divisions, etc. Along that cell file, the youngest cells are at the tip of the root, the older cells are at the upper part of the root. So what does this mean? Is that means that any, at any one time, if we look along a root, we have all of the developmental stages, from stem cell to early cell, more developed cell, more differentiated cell, all to fully differentiated cells. Now in the endodermis, something we've been discussing, that cell layer we've been discussing that is missing from the short root mutant, for example, there is a signature differentiated feature. It's called the Casparian strip. The Casparian strip acts as a barrier. It acts as a barrier to water. So water actually, when it comes from the outside of the root, can go between the cells all the way into the vascular tissue unless there's a Casparian strip. So the Casparian strip is actually a, a waterproofing that goes around the endodermis, each of the endodermal cells, and it's blocking water from coming in. It gets stopped there, and so that means that the outer layer of the endodermis has channels to allow only certain amount of water through, 
and also whatever is dissolved in the water, nitrogen, phosphate, etc., that has to be, that can be selectively taken up before it gets into the vascular tissue. <laughs> you can see these, this Casparin strip on a transverse section. They look like, when, when stained, it looks like these little red or orange points are around the root. And what this is, what the staining is, is something called lignin. This is a, a waterproofing that is made by the plant only in these very specific locations. Where the Casparin strip is localized is dependent on something called the CASP proteins. This stands for Casparian strip associated protein. These were identified by Nico Geldner as <clears throat> proteins that localize the Casparian strip along the membrane of the endodermis. These can be uh, marked with GFP, that is GFP, green fluorescent protein, is fused to the, the coding sequence of the CASP genes. And this is a good marker for differentiation then. We know that these CAS proteins are turned on only in one location in the endodermis and only when the endodermis is becoming terminally, local, uh, terminally lo uh, differentiated. And so we decided to perform a, a genetic screen. And this time we're asking for genes that when mutated affect the expression of the CAS protein. And so these could be, hopefully, regulators of the end stages of differentiation. Previously with short root and scarecrow, we identified mutations that affected the very early stages of stem cell division. Now we're looking for genes that affect this very end stage of, of this process of going from stem cells to fully differentiated tissue. <laughs> and what we found was we, we did this screen by looking under the microscope. So individual plants were placed under the microscope where on the left you see this is what the normal plant looks like. This is the Cas protein localized in this case to the nucleus. And then we were looking for things that look like this, that where either the Cas protein was turned off entirely or possibly was, was changed its localization. What we found were mutants that actually had completely wiped out the expression of these CASP genes. And when we, we characterized them further, they turned out to be <laughs> a, 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 another transcription factor called MIB36. And we asked, well, now that we have something that changes the last stages of differentiation, can we use it, or maybe short root, which stained, we know is involved in the whole differentiation program of endodermis, can we use these to change a tissue that has a totally different program? In this case, we're talking about the outer layer, the epidermis. And we asked if we express short root by using a promoter that functions only in the epidermis, or this MIB36 in the epidermis, can we cause it to become endodermis? Is that sufficient? Is it enough to just take one transcription factor, cause it to be expressed in a different tissue, to completely change the identity of that other tissue. When we tried MIB36, it sort of worked. Not, it was not very effective. However, when we tried short root, we did find that when we put it in to the epidermis, when we caused short root to be expressed in the epidermis, in this case, we found evidence for, for uh, the CASP genes to be turned on now in the epidermis, as well as lignin, so actually evidence for Casparian strip. There was a problem though, as shown in this movie, that what you're looking at is the CASP expression turning on. And you notice that it's not turning on in every cell. It doesn't even stay on. It turns on and turns off. And so we couldn't quite understand why we couldn't get it on in every cell. We knew short root was being expressed in every cell of the epidermis, but why was why did we get terminal differentiation only in a few cells and it wasn't even terminal? It lasted for a while and then turned off again. And so what we found was that there was something missing and what was missing was a small peptide. The peptide means about 20 amino acids, so it's not as big as most proteins, just a very, very small number of amino acids that forms something that 
it interacts with a receptor to cause something to happen. What happens, as shown again from Nico Geldner's lab, was that this protein is made in the vascular tissue. It goes from the vascular tissue over to the endodermis, and there it causes the Casparian strip to fully close. The Casparian strip, in the absence of this peptide, has little uh, holes in it. When this peptide comes across, it causes it to completely close. And we wondered, well, what if we add this peptide to our, our plants that are expressing short root in the epidermis, will we see any change? And in fact, we saw a dramatic change. So now when we added this peptide CIF2, we see almost every cell ha now has a Casparian strip. The surprise was, it's not every cell in the outer layer, but every cell in the next layer under this. Now there are multiple layers here again, a little like when short root is expressed in the endodermis, when it's expressed in the epidermis, you also get multiple layers. It's only the next layer in, the subepidermal layer, that now has Casparian strip all the way around it. And so we have really been able to change the identity, completely change the identity of a cell layer to a, what looks like a fully differentiated endodermal cell by expressing one transcription factor, short root, and the addition of this peptide hormone CIF2. So let me summarize what I've, I've gone through in this introduction to root genetics. First, we talked about studying plants actually could help to find solutions to some of the absolutely most critical issues facing the planet today. Also pointed out that roots play really important roles in both plant growth and health, but up until recently, it's been difficult to study them. Now, by using new approaches by, by looking at plants grown outside of soil. We can do genetic screens for mutants. In our case, the first one we did was a very simple screen, just looking for mutants with shorter roots. And we identified two, one that we called short root, and the other one scarecrow. And it turns out that both of them are actually missing a critical cell layer. What I then showed you was that short root protein physically moves from one cell layer into the next, and that movement is critical for its function. Then we showed that if you put short root in where, where it's not supposed to go, in the first time we put it in the endodermis, caused it to be expressed in the endodermis, and that dramatically changed the pattern of the cell layers and the root, making lots of ectopic cell layers. Then we did a genetic screen for for changes in the terminal differentiation pattern and identified MIB36, which has a really important role in controlling those end-stage differentiation functions. And finally, I showed that expression of short root in the outer layer, in the epidermis, combined with a peptide factor, can lead to a complete change in cell identity. This is an image of my laboratory, people who did the work that I talked about, uh, eating at a nice local restaurant. There are sources of funding for this work. And I want to point out that this is part one of two parts, where in the second part, I go into much more depth as to how these different factors, as well as other uh, genes that are involved in root development, how they function, and how roots actually form and explore their soil environment.